Ik heb een kijken. Ik heb sowieso nog wat meer vandaag wel zo. Ik heb één artikel 
Education in action. 
because we're, we've been consistently uh, underfunded for the last 10 years at least and we're, we've reached rock bottom. So something has to change. That's why we're now outside. Uh, there were lectures outside yesterday. Uh, you guys are very lucky because bus is going to take you out outside again tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs> so you have the first hour inside, second hour outside. Um, you're not nearly a hundred people in the outside. There should be a hundred. Maybe, maybe, maybe the rest will show up later, or they'll 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 um, guess that the uh, they'll hope that the uh, recording works out and they catch it on YouTube. So if you're seeing this on YouTube. You should have been here, it was fun. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Um, this is my first outdoor lecture ever. So this is, uh, I'll have to uh, see how that goes. So um, today's topic is uh, about um, uh, specificity and sequence entropy. This is actually about, well, it's sort of jumping ahead of what, we're, what you're going to do in the next course in uh, algorithms and sequence analysis. When you have alignments uh, and the, the stuff you can do with that. So, you haven't seen many alignments. Well, you've seen some alignments. Um, but this is an example of an alignment where you might want to do some analysis on. And um, who, recognizes some, who recognizes this alignment? Nobody. Well, this, it's, the, the, the title gives a hint. Yeah. So what does that tell you? It's antibodies, right? Um, so we're looking at antibody, and it's not the whole uh, protein sequence. It's just a part. It's, it's, it's one of the most interesting parts. Uh, what is the interesting part about an antibody? Variable domain. The variable domain. So how can you see that this is the variable domain? Lots of difference. There's lots of differences, right? It's variable. And where can you see that? Um, main, well, over here for, for, for one, right? So there's a couple of uh, sequences that have a lot of uh, amino acids here. Uh, most of them don't, but even on the edges here, you see that there's uh, a lot of differences, smaller differences, right? And then if you're close enough that you can actually read the, the amino acids, you can see that even where all the sequences have amino acids, they're all different. Um, on the other side, literally, you see the flanking regions, which are much more conserved, and they're highlighted. Uh, so the, the, the coloring is uh, based on the, the type of amino acid. Uh, and so here you have the blue, uh, blue bar, which is predominantly uh, aromatic. Then there's another one which is uh, hydrophobic, uh, and then there's a. You have to, you have to keep it at the fist length. The microphone, because if you do it closer, it's very annoying. Um, then, so so you see some some conserved residues here, right? And uh, on different locations, uh, there's a there's a very interesting pair. Which is actually, I th I'm not sure if all, does anybody know, do all the high, uh, all the variable loops uh, in the immunoglobulin have this pair of very important amino acids? It's a very cryptic question. I know that. So you can actually see it in the sequence. There's a pair of amino acids that are not hydrophobic or aromatic because they're colored differently. And there's one on each side of the loop. I'm not good with colors, but you probably mean this one. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, and there's another one on the other side, over there. Yeah. And it's a cysteine. And um, then, if you know your chemistry, you know what two cysteines do. Yeah, they make a covalent cysteine bridge or a sulfur bridge because it's the sulfurs in the cysteine side chains that are connected. Uh, why is this important? Because uh, the the rest of the um, of, of the uh, immunoglobulin uh, um, protein is actually structured and this variable loop has to be variable to be able to recognize different epitopes but you want this, 
this floppy bit not to influence the rest of the structure. So you basically have a, a staple um, or glue to, to hold the ends of this variable loop together so it can be flexible and the rest of the protein can be structured. Okay. So now, so these are things you can get out of this alignment when you know a bit about the biology. Um, but the, the real problem that we have as bioinformaticians is the other way around. We should be able to look at an alignment, or rather we should be able to write algorithms that analyze these alignments and tell us something about what the biology should be. And that's much harder, and that's, this, this lecture is part of what we can do in that area. Right? Uh, so, so the first thing you can do is identify uh, conserved residues. And then there's lots of other things you can do. So that's uh, that's for the next two hours. Right then. So um, this should go on. It doesn't. Interesting. <coughs> Frozen. It's too cold. No? Oh. Okay, so this is a different example. Here you see, um, I've, who has not seen sequence logos before? Who doesn't know what a sequence logo is? Okay. So this, these are sequence logos. And these are basically a shorthand notation of uh, an alignment where you condense the, the frequency of the, the different residues on different positions into the height of the letter. So there's there's a conserved uh, e, uh, glutamate. Glutamate? Ah, <laughs> uh, glutamic acid. Yeah, that's glutamate. Glutamic acid is glutamate. So um, because I I remember because glutamate ends with an e. So that, that's why I remember the e. Um, and it's high because it's conserved. Now, there's also a lot of alanine in the neighboring residue, but it's not so well conserved because you see some other stuff squashed down in the bottom. Right, and now, we'll, we'll get into, uh, who knows what information entropy? Who, who hasn't heard of information entropy yet uh, before? Good, because that's the lecture. Um, the, so the, the height of the, let, of the letter here is actually scaled by the Information content or the information entropy in the in the thing that makes why because the total frequency of uh, the letters should be the same in all positions. So if you just scale this with the frequency, then all the bars will be filled to the top. But what you do to make it more visible where the conservation is, you scale it with the entropy. So a completely conserved uh, residue has the highest weight, and less conserved increasingly have lower weights. Okay. Um, and this is actually, so this is an aquaporin, which is an outer membrane protein for uh, bacteria, which lets through water out through the uh, outer membrane. And um, only water, not all, the not all the small molecules. And the, what, the reason it can do that is because it has this string of polar residues that are lining the inside of the cavity. So it's very polar and only water can uh, actually go through it. Uh, there's more. There's more to that, but I'll, I'll skip that for uh, the sake of time. Um, oh, wait. <coughs> that helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but now I have to stand still. I can't. Stand still. <laughs> uh, so. People that are more on stage than I am, uh, they actually have microphone training. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm going to skip this in, in this for the sake of time, um, because the, the first thing that we need to do, if, if I'm sort of slipping away, please tell me, right? because I can still hear myself, <laughs> but you can't hear me. Um, <laughs> So the first thing we need to do is count conservation. And what it is about is um, 
is actually looking at things that deviate from what you expect. So now we're going to take a step back and, uh, and, and work out how that, how that fits. So if you're looking at an alignment of, of, of protein sequences, and then we focus on a single column of um, basically um, equivalent residues that, that arise from different proteins from different species. Yeah, so there's it could be yeast and E. coli and uh, humans and plants and we're all looking at I don't know cytochrome C. Yeah, I think all species have a cytochrome C, and and we're looking at one column of the alignment of cytochrome C uh, protein sequences across many many different species. What is our naive expectation for the um, the variation of amino acids that you'll find in one column? So we're looking at this is my this is this is my cartoon for an alignment, and we're looking at one column. What do you expect? Residues from the same group. Sorry? Residues from the same group. Residues from the same group. Oh, you mean like all uh, like uh, um, um, aliphatic or yeah. or polar ones? So something like this. Yeah, so if you know your amino acids, these are all small hydrophobic ones. Um, and but what? Um, why? Why would that be? I'm, as I'm asking for your random expectation, right? But you've you've already put another expectation on top of this. <clears throat> okay, granted, it's it, I, I let that in because I say these are all cytochrome C. So why, if it's all cytochrome C, do you expect the amino acids here to have similar properties? Because they're conserved, right? Because they're all cytochrome C, and if you change everything, it's probably not a cytochrome C anymore. Yeah? Or it breaks, it still, it still folds like a protein, but it, it doesn't function like a cytochrome C enzyme anymore. <laughs> So probably these things are conserved. Now, let's let's widen our scope and say we have a collection of proteins that we align, and we don't even know if they're properly related. Yeah, but they come from very many different species, and we've aligned them. So now, in that scenario, what is our random expectation? You've aligned them so they're the same region. Yeah, but if they're not related, what's the average? What's the average uh, identity between two unrelated sequences that you expect, roughly? There's twenty. There's twenty different amino acids. Five percent. Five percent, right? Okay. So that means if I have uh, seven, six sequences. They're probably all going to be different. Yeah, that's that's random. Yeah, well, really random is when when one when two of them are actually the same. Otherwise, it's not not random. It's unlikely that they're all different. So this is what we what we expect if we let three billion years of evolution happen on on the, on an ancestor sequence, and there's nothing special that that. Uh, change the random uh, introduction of, uh, of mutations. This is what you get. Yeah, we, we, it's it's hard to find it because how do you align them if they're if they're so divergent? Right? Um, I have to see where I'm going. Oh yes, ah, got it. So now the, we can look at the opposite side. We can we can take the cytochrome C again, and we're now looking. Let me check if I'm still in. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, th I don't think you can actually read it. Okay. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Where was I going? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have our cytochrome C now, and uh, I, I don't know, anybody happens to know what is the crucial um, um, catalytic residue in the cytochrome C? I don't remember. But let's say there is an aromatic residue which, uh, which is very important. So, right? so then you'll find maybe it has to be a tryptophan. You'll find this, right? So why is this? So now the question is, why is this so important? Uh, or how can you measure the importance of this versus that? Can you quantify that? So wh why is this the likely outcome? It's another way to look at it. Random chance. Sorry? Because it's based on random chance. Random chance. So how can you how can you quantify random chance? If you throw a die, uh, let's say a six-sided die, and you throw it twenty times, you expect to see different numbers. If you if you get a two all the time. <coughs> then there's something odd with very likely there's something wrong with the die yeah, because it shouldn't do that that's the same here because um, but why is that how can you see that if you if you throw let's take a 20 20 sided die right every every side is an amino acid if you throw it six times how many ways are there to get a conserved tryptophan? 22 to the power of 6. Hmm? 20 to the power of 6. 22 to the power of 6. 20 to the power of 6 ways to get a tryptophan. That's all options. No, it's, you have 20 to the power of 6 possible different sequences of amino acids that are collections of, of 6 amino acids that you can right? You have 20 options for the first. 20 options for the second makes 400. 20 options for the third makes uh, <coughs> 8,000, and so on. Yeah, 20 to the sixth, um, which is about uh, a billion, 100 million or so. <coughs> so, um, how many options are there to get so a conserved tryptophan? 120 multiplied by 120 multiplied by 120. Yeah, but I, I was asking. I was asking a simpler question. How many ways are there to get? Oh, just one. There's only one way, right? Only if all six ones are tryptophan do you get conserve, completely conserved tryptophan. So there's only one way to get this. How many ways do you get a tryptophan, a valine, an isoleucine, a tyrosine, and two serines? Also one way. Well, if they have to be in this order, yes. But any one of them can be the tryptophan, any one of them can be the valine, uh, and, and it doesn't matter really whether it was these six or five, it could, be any, it could have been any other, right? So there are roughly 20 to the six ways to get this, maybe a few, few less because there's, there's odd ones that you're not, not counting, but this is only a handful. Maybe this is a million, but this is a hundred million, yeah? So this is... 20, uh, 20 to the power 6 minus n, where n is a relatively small number. Yeah? <laughs> so that's why this is much more likely than this. <coughs> yeah? Makes sense. Okay, now, um, the next step is. So we actually have some examples on the, on the, on the screen as well. Uh, if you have three amino acids, there's only one way to get three tryptophans. But if you have three ren... Oh, it doesn't work. Three um, If you have three different amino acids, and it doesn't matter which one they are, then you have six ways with only three sequences. If you have... Uh, sorry, three... Uh, Six ways with three sequences, yeah. If you have six sequences, then it's much more even, yeah? Because there's... Well, how do you count that? How do you, how do you count the number of ways to get this? Let's, let's do this one. We have six. So how many ways are there to get a mix of five amino acids in a set of six? Five, that's four. 
Sorry? Oh, it's a, a faculty of six. Yes. Well, to get six different ones. Uh, to get five different ones. To get, that's to get six different ones. Yeah. Um, yeah? So, so if, I, if I write this, everybody understands what I'm saying. Who's not sure? Okay. The, the first one, so now it's, it's blank, right? So we have nothing yet. And we're going to draw them randomly. Um, but the first one is a tryptophan. And there's, there's six options to put it. Right? We can put it here or there, or there's just just six options. So that's six. Right? Uh, and let's say we put it here. The second one is a valine. And there's there's five options left to put it. So we can times five. Okay, so to, to put these two there, there's six options for the tryptophan and five options for the valine. So in total there's thirty options, thirty thirty ways to do the valine and it doesn't matter which one you put first, because whether it's 6 times 5 or 5 times 6, it's still 30. Um, and then, uh, what was the third one? The tyrosine. There's four options left. Yeah? And then, uh, doesn't it really doesn't matter. Isolucine uh, times 3. And then uh, there's, there's two options left for the serine. And the last one, actually, there's only one option left. Uh, what? So that's 6 times 5 is 30 times 4 is 120 times 3 is uh, 360 times 2 is 720. 720 ways to get this. And this grows pretty, pretty rapidly when you have more sequences. Yeah, so for three sequences, it's only six. For six sequences, it's uh, 720. Yeah, yes. So, because they're too serious. Okay. That's, that's correct. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so. So now, this, this, is, this is why uh, conservation is such a strong signal in, in, in biology, because if you see a, 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 a dominant, it doesn't have to be all tryptophans, it could be uh, uh, one other, it, it, it's small differences, right? But still, the, the number is going to be very small uh, compared to the other option. Okay. Let's see where we go. Uh -uh. <laughs> like a magic shit. <laughs> okay, so now there's actually a way to measure this, and it's called information entropy. And uh, it, it, it was derived by, uh, by Shannon in the uh, early 1940s as a way to measure the information content of a message because he was interested in uh, radio broadcasting or sending radio messages. Uh, in which in those days were just uh, spoken uh, messages and he wanted to measure the amount of information lost after transmission and so he was looking for a way to measure the amount of information before and after transmission and if you subtract it you get the amount of loss the amount of information that was lost and he, he was um, um, he was deriving it in this way that he said well if you think about um, the information content in a message, you actually have, um, um, what's the word for it? It's um, an uh, occurrence, there's a different word for occurrence. So, event, yes, that's the word. So each, each word in an English sentence is an event which, which has a certain probability. And so let's say there's, for the, for the first word in a sentence, there's, there's three options where the, uh, the first word is the most likely, it's 50%, and then the second one is one third, and the, and the third one is, is one sixth, this adds up to one. 
and this. Um, but let's now say that you have you split this up. So maybe uh, the first word is, or one of these words isn't the word, but a phrase. It's actually two words. Uh, so you would like to have a measure that doesn't depend exactly on how you cut your sentence into words or into phrases. So that means if you, uh, if you like say a phrase of like is a, your your information content of the sentence shouldn't depend on whether you count is and a as independent events or is a as a combined event where you have a different probability. So in, in this case, you could have instead of one event with three different uh, probabilities, you could have two events where the first event has two options with equal probability, and the second event has two options with two thirds, one third probability. And if you work this out, that means that this option is, is 50%. And this combination is one third, and this combination is one sixth. So in the end, you have three options which have the same frequency as these three options. And you want your information content to be the same in either case. So if you have, uh, and let's call it age, of this set of probabilities, that should be the same as the sum of the information content of these two events that, that lead to the same outcome. Because you don't know exactly which events went before, uh, went into getting the outcome. Can you try a different example, maybe? What's what's not clear? Um. <laughs> uh, let me think. Um. Let's, let's try to break it down. So, this first part, yeah. this is okay? Yeah. Okay, so now, because when we're observing, we can, we can, we can take this back to alignments, where each of the, uh, uh, we don't know the events, the, we don't know this structure, we only know the frequencies of the different outcomes that we get, right? So we can say we have uh, one sixth uh, final alanine. Uh, let's make it. I'll, I'll make it have the same frequencies. Uh, so there's uh, what's that? One third. <coughs> we have one half tryptophan, <coughs> and we have one sixth phenyl alanine. Right. Um, now we're counting the output. But you could also, if you know how, which mutation events happened uh, in the in the evolutionary history to get this outcome, then the the probabilities of these mutation events to combined should give the same frequency as the amino acids that you have in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So because like these three amino acids didn't happen in one event, like this uh, situation suggests. So it was actually two steps. Right? So there was one, yeah, so maybe it was a tryptophan first, and then it mutated into an alanine. And, and then uh, in one case, the alanine mutated into a phenylalanine, right? Yeah. So you get the same outcome, half, half tryptophan, half, uh, one, two thirds, uh, alanine and one sixth uh, phenylalanine, but you can also count it as these two independent events that led to this outcome. Right? So you can look at the outcome, and then you have this information content, or you look at the events that lead to the outcome. But it should be the same. That should have. Uh, there's no difference in. Uh, there's only more inf more sort of structure in it, but it's, it's the same thing. But so if you measure them independently and you add them up, you would like to have a measure that comes to the same uh, outcome here, to the same value of the information uh, content in, the, in the, uh, the events that you measure. Yeah? Yeah, clear. 
Thanks. Okay, so, um, and I'm not going to go through the derivation. There's a very nice paper there. I should have, of course. Do I have the? <coughs> did I have the link on the? Oh yeah, the link is here. Uh, so if you want to look it up, the derivation is in there. Yeah. Yeah. Which last part? This is this adds up to one. These yeah. add up to one. <laughs> and these half plus one third plus one sixth adds up to one. One third one uh, one sixth plus two sixths plus three sixths. A half is three sixths, the third is two sixths, one sixth is one sixth. If you add up three sixths plus two sixths plus one sixth, it's six sixths is uh, one. But you're not the only one who doesn't see this. Um, the, from anecdotal evidence, uh, we have we, we think that most people in computer science don't immediately see that this adds up to one. But most other people do. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> Different way of looking at things. Yeah, you, uh, you're you're with us again. Good. Um, who has the time? I don't know what the time is. I have no clock. Nine Okay, we have ten minutes left. Good. Um, Right, so I, I won't go through the derivation now, but the, the formula that he came up with, uh, which he can derive from the, the, the from the requirements that he had, so actually, I, I, I did list all the requirements, it should sum up to one, uh, and, and, and a few other things. Oh, no, sorry, the, the, the probability should, have, should, should sum up to one. Uh, this is the formula that he came up with. So if you have n events, uh, n options for an event, uh, and the probability of each of these options is p i, then uh, this is your information content of the set of, uh, of outcomes for the event. And uh, it's, it's zero if there's no choice. Um, and there's no choice, choice if, uh, if there's only one p that is not zero which also means that it has to be one, because they have to add up to one. Um, and to, the example I always use is if you have elections uh, in, a, in a country with an authoritative regime, then there's usually, you can, there's elections, but there's only one guy you're, you're supposed to vote on. There could be even more candidates, but you'll probably end up in jail if you vote for any of the other ones. So uh, then there's one option, and then there's, there's not really much information gained from ha having the elections. Well, you, you can, it's very easy to predict what the outcome will be. Um, I'm not going to give any examples of countries, but you can probably think of a few. Um, the other extreme is where the, the, the information content is highest, is when all probabilities are equal, which happens a lot in Europe and also in the American election, well, to, to some extent in American elections, where, the, where the, in the polls all the candidates have uh, Roughly, or there's a, there's a big set of candidates that have roughly equal uh, probability in the polls. Then you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right? Um, so then there's a lot of information gained from actually having the elections, because then you know who's going to be uh, get the, the, the highest probability. Okay. Um, so this is uh, just summing it up. So if you do this for bigger numbers, so now we go back to the alignments, right? And now we go, um, so the, 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 the tricky way, so how do you now come from, how do, oh, oh, that's, I, I, there's a different way to get the, the information entropy, and that's to continue the story that I started here, uh, because I haven't connected these faculties up with the uh, Shannon information entropy. Um, and one of the tricky thing is, is that if you have, a, this is a very small alignment. Uh, if you have a decent, uh, even well, not even a very big alignment, but this is, uh, I forgot, 23 or so, 
33 uh, sequences, then there's already, uh, there's about 10 to the 23 different options to get a mixture of four amino acids. That's not even completely unconserved. Yeah? So uh, th these numbers are, are awkward to work with, so you would like to have a slightly more convenient way to do that. Um, this is what I already did on the board. Yeah. Um, so we can actually go, uh, and here I use S, but in the previous slide it was H because Sh Shannon used H for his information uh, measure. Uh, but there's a different way to do this, where H is the logarithm of omega, and omega is actually our number that we calculated here. So, oh, that was right. Uh, yeah, so it's the number. It's it's called the um, the, the number of uh, realization states. So it's the number of ways in which you can get a certain outcome. Uh, so if, if, if I go back to the original example where it's a conserved tryptophan and there's only one way to get it, then uh, then you have the omega is one, logarithm of one is zero. So your information can. So your information entropy, your information content is zero. That's because it's a conserved tryptophan. So you're not surprised if the next sequence is also a tryptophan. There's nothing new that you've learned from looking at the next sequence. Because it's going to be a tryptophan, you know that. Whereas here, uh, every new sequence is going to bring you more information because it's uncertain. Yeah? That's the way to look at it. Okay, so 